Hey everybody, welcome to the show. My name's Aaron Newcomb, thanks for joining me today. On this episode, I'm gonna be exploring a laptop which is a little unusual. I had heard about these at the time back in the mid 90s, these laptops that actually had a printer built in. So I finally found one of those laptops to try. Will it work? We're gonna find out today on the Retro Hack Shack. Today we're going to be taking a look at the Canon NoteJet 2 486C. I got this particular laptop from a fellow collector uh, who was interested in getting rid of it, and I got it because, as the name implies, NoteJet, this is not just an ordinary laptop. This laptop actually has a printer built in. This feature just fascinates me because it would allow a road warrior salesperson or somebody like that on the road a lot to just take this laptop with them and instead of having to find a printing center like a Kinko's or something like that, they could just print out an invoice or uh, perhaps an order form right at the customer's site. This laptop came out in 1994 when laptops were really starting to come into their own but manufacturers weren't quite sure what feature set the end user really wanted. So there were dozens of laptops with dozens of features all hitting the scene at the same time for astronomical prices. Now Canon is not a brand that's known for their laptops. So it's a little odd that Canon would produce a laptop, but I guess they saw this as a way to enter the market. I was able to find a brochure on the NoteJet 2 486C, and you can see that they're advertising the fact that you're bringing your printer with you wherever you go. Looking at the specs for this laptop, it's certainly not high-end, but it is adequate. It does have a 486 SLC 2 running at 50 megahertz. It comes with four megabytes of RAM standard, but that was expandable to 12 megs, not too bad and it comes with either 130 meg or 260 megabyte hard drive. Now the battery life leaves something to be desired, only 2.5 hours of standard operation on the battery, so you do want to definitely take your power adapter with you. Unfortunately for me, this laptop did not come with a power supply. I was only able to find a couple of reviews in magazines from the time. This one from Byte Magazine is the barest of reviews. It basically just says it's adequate uh, for those that need a computer and a printer built into one. It does note that you can lift the keyboard to expose the paper feed slot, and apparently there was a paper tray that you could attach to the rear of the laptop for holding your paper that you were printing. And just look at that price tag, $3,868 for this thing when it was fully specced out. I also found a review from PC World in October of 1994. They call out this big, bright, 10.3 inch passive color screen. Uh, when I hear passive color, I don't really think of great quality, so we'll have to see how good this looks. One of the things that they call out is that the Canon design emulates the IBM ThinkPad's keyboard with TrackPoint pointing device. I think this is more than a coincidence. That's because there was a version of this same laptop that IBM released as the IBM ThinkPad 555BJ, but it was only available in Japan. You can see by the look of it, it is the exact same laptop, so either Canon OEM'd this from IBM, or IBM OEM'd this from Canon. When we open this up, we'll have to see if the track point is there in the middle of the keyboard. Now let's take a look at what this laptop actually looks like. It's rather boxy overall and not that much thicker than a normal laptop. Of course, this one does have some extra buttons on the top to turn the printer on and off feed paper and stop and restart the printer. When I open the lid, there are a row of LEDs across the top to display various functions. And yes, indeed, there is the track point device, the little nipple or whatever you like to call it, <laughs> eraser head that is classic for IBM ThinkPad. So definitely some similarities, if not some OEM action going on. On the back of the laptop, there is a PS2 port, a COM port, a VGA port, a parallel port, and it looks like an expansion slot. And of course we have the power plug on the far right. 
On the right side of the laptop, there are only two PCMCIA slots, but you'll notice those blue eject buttons. I believe those were common on IBM ThinkPads of this era. Turning now to the back, you can see that the battery is missing from this particular laptop. Not a problem in this case. And you'll also notice some flip tabs in the back of the laptop. That's for propping the laptop up at an angle if it makes it easier to type. And zooming in on this label, you can see the particulars of the actual model number as well as the power requirements. Removing the hatch on the back, you can see there's a spot for a math code processor as well as some memory. And there is a lithium battery. It doesn't look like this one's caused too much corrosion, hopefully. Looking at the very front of the laptop, there's just a slot here for the paper feed. And I thought it would be nice to compare this with another laptop I reviewed recently on the channel, and that's this Packard Bell from about 1992 or so. I don't remember the exact year, but you can see that this laptop is about half an inch bigger all the way around when viewed from the top. And in terms of the overall height of the laptop, you can see there's not a whole lot of difference. It is bigger or thicker, I guess, than the Packard Bell. But when you consider that there's a full-blown printer inside, that's pretty amazing. And you may have noticed as I was uh, giving you the tour that there is some damage to this particular laptop. There's some screws that are missing, especially this one right here in the middle. So it appears that someone's taken a crack at this in the past. And here's uh, the corner, which is completely broken off and will need to be repaired. And then on the other side where the hard drive uh, bay is, there's this interesting screw. Uh, I guess this is to provide easy access to that hard drive, but it sticks out like a sore thumb. It's very odd to have a coin turned screw in the middle of this laptop. Now, as I mentioned, I'm missing the power adapter for this laptop and the power socket is basically a barrel socket, but it's a three millimeter uh, center pin on that particular socket. And I don't have any barrel jacks that are the right size. So I'm actually just increasing the uh, size of a normal barrel plug here. You have to be very careful. I don't recommend doing this for the average user, uh, but this is uh, extra thick solid metal, not the pin type. And uh, I think I can do this safely. However, I will be replacing this with a standard three millimeter pin jack as soon as I can. But before I plug anything in, I'm definitely gonna to check to make sure that I didn't create any shorts by drilling out the middle of that plug. So I plug this up to my benchtop power supply and let's give it a try. Here goes nothing. I think it's working. But even though I was seemed to be getting hard drive activity and power lights, I still couldn't see anything on the display. Well, now that the display has been running for a while and it seems to be working fine after getting warmed up or whatever, uh, I can show you what it looks like when it boots up. So before I was just getting beeps when this screen would come up and I'm assuming that's because the battery is dead. And if I hit enter a number of times, because I figured it was on a prompt something, it would actually go ahead and boot off the hard disk. And I could tell because I could hear the hard disk and I could see the, uh, the hard disk light going. But now that the display is warmed up, I can see exactly what's going on on the screen and it's asking me for a prompt. So I'm sure the battery is indeed dead and we'll have to change that. That'll be one thing we'll have to change. Also notice this, uh, uh, I don't know what this is, a spaceship up here or something. Uh, it kind of goes all over the screen. Oh, look, you can, that's, it goes all over the screen because you can move it with the mouse. It's the mouse cursor. What? That's crazy. Look at that. So I'm assuming I could, if I wanted to change the year, I could do that here. Yeah. Oh, that is cool. Look at that. It's the mouse cursor. That's awesome. The mouse cursor is a spaceship. <laughs> but let me use the cursor and we'll go over and see if this will go all the way up to 2021. It does accept 2021, so let's see, what's the date today? Hey Google, what's the current date? It is Saturday, June 12th, 2021. Okay, so let's set this to June. Whoops, went too far. And I wanna hit enter here, but I also wanna see what happens if I click over here on this thing. Nothing. Okay, I'll just hit enter and see if it goes to the next screen. 
Okay, here we go. There's a nice little setup screen here, actually. Uh, date and time, which we just did. There's setup one, power save, password, setup two, test, and restart. Also, notice this BIOS. I didn't notice this before. It's copyright IBM, 1992-1994. Uh, interesting. Let's go into setup one and just see what that is. Wow, this is a nice little graphical interface here for a setup program. I've never seen anything like this. Ah, oh, look at that. We've got our usable memory, 8K, or sorry, 8 megs. Uh, so I guess there's 4 megs in here. I think you can go all the way up to 12 megs. So if you put another, if, you, if this was 8 meg stick instead of a 4 meg stick, you could get up to 12 megs on this machine. And then they have pointing device here. You can see it's set for track point. Oh, that just disables the track point. It either enables or disables the track point. Very interesting. And let's see what the test does. Oh, wow. Look at this. So you can test the keyboard, the planner, planar. Is that like the motherboard? Floppy drive, parallel port. You can test all this stuff, really? Hmm. Let's test the video, see what happens. Oh, look at that. It's got like the DOS modes. Very cool. And it's just cycling through the various DOS modes and the color looks really, really good for this screen. These are kind of crappy screens, but yeah, I like this. Well, here we go into Windows 3.1. Looking great. And I really want to see if I can get the, the first thing I want to do, first of all, this is very plain. Look at this. This must have been a business person's laptop <laughs> there's no colorful backgrounds there's nothing uh it's just very plain but i do want to see um uh if i can get the output to go over to the uh capture card so that we can take a so you can see the screen better as i'm going through some of this stuff and also i'm noticing that this pacemate i have no idea what pacemate is i'll be honest um that window was left open by whoever was using this before so I want to go in and see if I can figure out what Pacemate is. Maybe there's some records in there that can indicate where this particular laptop was used in the past. But first, let's go into, let's try this operating environment and see if I can get the uh, this running on the capture card. So I'm just going to hit CRT. Okay. Okay, well, this went black, so let me see if the capture is actually working now. Okay, well, I had to uh, I had to restart the laptop, but when I did that, everything now is going to the CRT. So I'm guessing the the startup menu, which also let me choose CRT, would have worked either way. Either I could have used the uh, you know the uh, the setup the BIOS part, or I could have used Windows to do it. So they must be they must have the drivers loaded to be able to change that setting in the BIOS to uh, uh, output to the CRT, which is why it makes sense I had to reboot it. That's what I'm guessing anyway. But this is looking really, really nice. So I'd like to be able to, to see if I can get a uh, higher resolution on this maybe, although this is pretty good. It looks really good. It's not bad. But I'm trying to remember where you go. Is it under control panel? It's been so long since I've used Windows 3.11. Uh, no, it's not here. Where the heck is it? No, it's here somewhere. This is the desktop stuff. Should we put up some wallpaper or something while we're here? Oh, there we go. That's something a little bit better to look at, at least. Uh, okay, so let's see. Where's the resolution? Maybe it's under Windows Setup. Remember back in the day there, you couldn't change the display from the control panel, if I remember correctly. Let's see. There's, okay, there's display, VGA. And if I do change system settings, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, so I can change the V, this is set to VGA currently. Oh, and there's video seven. I don't know if that would actually work. Let's see if there's some, oh yeah, here we go, super VGA. The mouse is kind of creeping, this little trackpad is creeping up. Let's see if we can go, ooh, we can go, 1024 by 768. See if this works. Am I going to need a disc for this? This is my original diskette uh, keeper here from back in the day, around actually when this laptop would have been around, back from the 
probably mid 90s, mid to uh, you know 96 or something like that, as I think when I had this. So yeah, here's Windows for Workgroups, and I need Windows for Workgroups disk one, and I just happen to have it right here. Yeah, it sounds like it's reading okay. Uh, now insert disk two. <laughs> okay. You need to restart Windows so the changes you made can take effect. Do not press Control Alt Delete to restart Windows. This will result in data loss. Restart Windows now. Okay. Yes, let's see if this works. Oh, almost at it. Not looking so good. Not looking so good. Hmm. Okay, well, I'm trying to figure out how to get back into Windows after it's not working on that higher resolution. Um, one thing that I noticed, though, is as I'm stepping through the Windows config, which you can do, uh, you've always been able to do ever since the beginning of Windows, I think, pretty much. Um, so I'm noticing that the uh, the driver is a Super VGA uh, driver or card in the system, at least that it looks like that. It's a WD90C24 card is installed. So it's seeing that card, and it says it supports um, SVGA, but only 640 by 480, 256 color. So somehow I'm going to have to get Windows back down to 640 by 480 in order to get back into this screen. All right, well, after mucking around with the uh, uh, INI files in the Windows directory and trying to fix it that way, I finally uh, did a directory listing, and I remembered there's a setup file. Of course there's a DOS setup file for Windows.3.1. I remember this. Once it comes up, it's like just goes off in your head. So, you know, it's 25 years ago. So cut me some slack here, folks. I haven't played around with this in a long time. But anyway, so now I think we can go up and change this um, to back to VGA, which is what we want. I think that will work. So there's VGA. To accept this list, press Enter. Uh, it's already installed. Looks good. There we go. So now if I hit win, should come back up in the right resolution. Looking good so far. There we go. Yay. It really is amazing to me that this hard drive is working after all of these years. I mean, uh, it's very satisfying to hear that hard drive sound that I remember so well from laptops of this era. Oh no, enter your password. What are the chances that it's blank? Well, you may not be able to get in here to see what this is. Oh, bummer. Yeah, it doesn't look like there's really anything else uh, interesting on this laptop. Nothing in startup. There's just that pacemate application that I can't get into. So, yeah, unfortunately, not a whole lot to see here. So under DOS, there were a few programs. Here's one called 12 Lead. And it says essentials of 12 lead ECG interpretation. So I'm guessing this is for like a medical thing. This looks like a heart here. Uh, press any key to continue. Yeah, interactive computer tutorial designed to improve the ECG diagnostic skills of the medical professionals. So here's a clue. This must be this this laptop must have been used for uh, someone in the medical industry. Yeah, so this is a this is a tutorial for everything you need to know about ECGs, I guess. Huh. And here's Word Perfect for Windows. Let's see if there's any files in here to take a look at. Oh, here we go. Routine pacemaker patient evaluation. So these are instructions, I guess, for using a pacemaker. So again, this was definitely used by somebody in the medical field. Aha, and here's an old-fashioned memo from uh, July 1995. Here are some charges for uh, the doctor. So this laptop must have been used by a nurse or an assistant or something. Yeah, so this must have been used with a with, so for either a receptionist or a traveling, uh, whoever this Kathy Fleming is, was uh, must have been an assistant for a doctor. That's why all the software's on here, and uh, that's why... Uh, 
there's not a, probably not a whole lot of interesting software, actually, besides WordPerfect and some other things. So now it's time to turn my attention to the printer. And before I get started, I just wanted to show you this little hatch on the front that opens up here. And you can see there is the ink cartridge. And if you lift this little latch, this little ink cartridge comes out. It's a BJI 101 monochrome bubble jet ink cartridge. And uh, yeah, no problems there. It's probably the ink is probably dry. See if I can rectify that in the future. And as promised, the keyboard does lift up so that you can feed your paper in. It has a little latch that holds the keyboard in place. And like most printers, it has a little guide for feeding the paper through the slot. However, I quickly realized that this printer has some issues. So I posted about this display problem on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, by the way, if you don't follow me on Instagram and Twitter, I do try to post in between episodes interesting problems like this or things that I'm working on. And a lot of times people have suggestions for how to fix problems that I'm seeing. Anyway, uh, one of my, uh, I think it was Instagram followers, actually suggested that this display problem may be caused by bad capacitors. So especially since this is in the early, or sorry, mid 90s when there was a lot of bad caps, uh, when I take this apart, I'm gonna be looking perhaps for some capacitors that need to be replaced. Maybe that'll fix this particular screen problem. Now, when I tried to first power on the printer, which actually has a separate power switch, something interesting happened and I wanna show you. Hopefully you can see my power uh, supply as well, the numbers on the power supply. This number down here is the amperage. So the laptop without the um, printer being on is currently consuming 0.6 amps, which is pretty good, I would say, for a laptop of this era. After all, it's gotta power the hard drive, uh, power all of the internals and stuff. So 0.6 amps or 600 milliamps, I think is pretty good for, for power consumption. But watch what happens when I turn on the printer. It immediately turns off in power cycles. And when it tries to come back on, you can see it's triggering the uh, overcurrent here. So I'm gonna turn that back off. Um, so one of two things is happening here. Either I have this set for two amps to deliver two amps. So either this power, either the printer is drawing more than two amps, which is possible, or there's a short in the printer. So what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn up the amperage a little bit more uh, to maybe four amps or something, try to turn it on again and see if we get that same problem. If we do, then I'm gonna look for a short when I open this up. Okay, so now I've got the amperage set to four amps. I'm gonna turn this on again, keep my fingers crossed and see what happens. Hopefully nothing blows up. Yeah, it does the same thing, although this time we just get error stop. So it definitely spiked the amperage up to four amps and then we just got uh, error stop. I don't wanna to go too high on this because I don't wanna short anything out, um, but I definitely have uh, error stop data. Let's see if any of the buttons actually are working. Doesn't look like it. Well, I'm not getting those current spikes anymore and now I just get error stop and data. Hopefully I didn't blow something that was already on the verge of blowing and by giving it more amperage, you know, blew out a chip or something, but we'll see. I'll take it apart and we'll have a look at what's inside. Well, at least the computer part of the laptop is working, but as you can see, the printer part is definitely having some problems. So on part two, I'm gonna be disassembling the laptop and taking a look at the various components and seeing if I can fix the printer capability of the laptop, or maybe it's just a lost cause. I don't know, but that'll be next time in part two. Uh, for all those that have subscribed, uh, really appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed, click the subscribe button and also consider supporting me on my Patreon page. I would really appreciate it. But until next time, thanks for watching. If you want to support me on Patreon, you can go to patreon.com slash RetroHackShack and sign up. End of line.